Section 1. You will hear a man called Matt inquiring about renting a holiday cottage. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. You will see that there is an example that has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Hello? Oh, hello. I'm interested in renting one of your holiday cottages. Uh, I'm afraid I don't know your name. I'm Alison. My husband Jonathan and I are the joint owners. Good. My name's Matt Harmon. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Hello? Oh, hello. I'm interested in renting one of your holiday cottages. Uh, I'm afraid I don't know your name. I'm Alison. My husband Jonathan and I are the joint owners. Good. My name's Matt Harmon. How can I help you, Matt? Some friends of ours have recommended your cottages to us. Uh, they stayed in one of them last summer, and my wife and I would like to come. Could you tell me something about them? They're part of a barn, aren't they? Yes, they're on a farm, surrounded by countryside, and it's very peaceful. We've converted the barn into two cottages, which are both the same, and everything's on the ground floor. Uh, the living room is quite big, with comfortable armchairs and a sofa, dining table, TV and Wi-Fi. OK. The kitchen is part of the living room. It's very well equipped, including an electric cooker, fridge freezer and microwave. And is there a dishwasher? Uh, I'm afraid not, as there isn't quite enough space for one. Well, I'm sure we can manage without one. After all, it's only for a week. Mm -hmm. And there's a double bedroom and a twin, both with plenty of storage space. What about the bathroom? Does it have a shower? Yes, a walk-in shower and a bath. Excellent. Let me tell you about the outside area. From the living room, there are glass doors leading out onto the patio, which is great for eating outdoors when the weather's fine. It has a table with a sunshade and four chairs, and catches a lot of sun. Is there a garden as well? Yes, each cottage has its own private garden. It's very pretty, and there's enough space for children to play. There's also a pond in the garden with fish and water lilies, so, of course, young children need to be supervised in case they fall in. And beyond the garden, there are fields and a small wood, though you can't get into them directly from the garden. That sounds very nice. The cottage is on a bit of a hill, and you can see a long way in one direction. We're quite close to the river, and although that's just out of sight, from the bedrooms the marina is visible. It's a very attractive view. There's a restaurant there, which is useful if you don't feel like cooking. That's handy. We might try it. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. As for facilities, we supply towels and bedding, and there's a laundry which both cottages use. 
It's in a separate building and has everything you need for washing and drying clothes. I don't suppose we'll need to use it, as we'll only be staying for a week. Is there a parking area? Oh, yes. There's a lot of room just outside, a couple of hundred yards after you turn off the road to reach the cottages. Well, it sounds ideal. I'd certainly like to book a cottage. Would the week beginning the 7th of May be possible? Ah, uh, oh, that's the bank holiday weekend, isn't it? I'll just check. Oh, I'm afraid both cottages are booked for that week. Um, would the 14th be any good for you? One of them is available then. Let me think. Uh, yes, that'd be okay. We'd need to change a couple of arrangements, but uh, I don't think it'll be a problem. How much will it cost for a week? Let me see. Um, May is mid-season, so it's £372, and we ask for a deposit of £200 to secure the booking. As soon as we've received that, we'll send you confirmation. The deposit is non-returnable, so we advise people to take out insurance in case they have to cancel for any reason. And the rest of the payment? That's due six weeks before you arrive. OK, that's fine. Uh, can I pay online? Yes, I'll give you our bank details. The money should be transferred to A and J Gribben. <laughs> I'd better spell out our surname for you. It's G R I double B E N. Got that. The sort code is. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now look at section 2. Section 2. You will hear the principal of a college talking to students about changes to the catering arrangements. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Right, good morning everyone. I'd like to tell you about our new food hall. As you know, the problem with the old canteen is that there's only one serving point, so people have to queue for a long time to be served. Well, the new food hall will come into operation next week. It'll have several serving points, so long queues will be a thing of the past. And the aim is to keep the food as healthy as possible. The Around the World food point, as its name suggests, will be truly international and serve food from a different culture each week. When the food hall opens, it's going to be Chinese food, followed by Mexican and then South African. The catering staff are working hard to master lots of different cuisines. I'm sure many of you will be interested in broadening your horizons and discovering what's eaten in other countries. One of the serving points is called Trad, and this will serve the best of traditional British food, along with pizzas and burgers. Six students from the catering department will be involved in preparing and cooking the food for a week at a time, as part of their training. British food may not have the best reputation, but I can guarantee that you'll be surprised how delicious it can be. Another food point is called Indian Delight. This will serve meat fish and vegetarian food from different parts of India as well as delicious desserts. 
you'll find the food is much more varied than in most Indian restaurants in this country. Everyone will be able to say what they'd like to see on the menu, so this will change from time to time to include your ideas. The specials corner will cater mainly for people who want to lose weight or are on special diets such as vegetarian or vegan or have food allergies. The catering staff will get to know people who regularly use this serving point and will be able to help them choose suitable food and tell them what to avoid. The deli will serve a range of wrapped cold food, like quiches and sandwiches, which you can take away to eat later, or at the picnic tables in the college grounds when the weather's warm enough. Although most people prefer hot food in the winter, we're sure some will find it useful to have this option in cold weather too. And finally, although some of the serving points will have salads available throughout the year, the salad bar will operate during the spring and summer terms. It'll serve a very wide range of salads using ingredients that are in season. If you think salads are boring, you're in for a surprise. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. The food served in the college consistently gets excellent feedback from everyone who eats it, and we're determined to maintain its high quality. At the moment, food is available at lunchtime and again before evening classes begin. In future, the food hall won't close in the afternoon. This will be more convenient for everyone. And while prices will be kept at the same level as they are now, we're introducing electronic cards which can be topped up online. This system will replace cash and speed up the payment process. I'm pleased to say that the catering staff are looking forward to the new system, as many of them would welcome the extra work, so additional staff won't be necessary. You may be wondering what will happen to the old canteen. Our original plan was to have it demolished, and construct a new classroom block on the site, but that turned out to be too expensive. Instead, there will still be tables and chairs in there, so it'll provide additional seating. You can take in food you've bought in the food hall or that you've brought from home. And on the walls, it'll have paintings done by students from the art department. There are a number of these that can be taken out of storage and put on show, so we'll all have the chance to appreciate them. OK, so that should bring you up to date with what's happening in... That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now look at section 3. Section 3. You will hear a student called Carol talking to Mike from the University Careers Service. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Oh, hello. Can I ask you for some advice, please? Of course. How can I help? Well, I'm doing a business degree. I'm in the second year. 
and I'd like to do a work placement for a few weeks during the summer, though I've no idea what. Is that something you can help with? It certainly is. Do you have any long-term plans for your career when you graduate? Ultimately, I'd like to work for an organisation that gives advice to small businesses, but I realise that before I can do that, I need to gain a range of experience working for companies of different sizes, and maybe in the public sector too. Okay. And are you finding that your course is helping you? Yes, much more than I expected, in fact. I knew a bit about marketing, and I'm getting a better idea of that, but the law module is a real eye-opener. It made me realise how important it is in business. Some of the other modules, like IT, are useful too, though not so much, because I used IT in my last job before coming to university. Oh, what were you doing? It was in the local hospital where I live. I had an admin job which included liaising with colleagues in different departments. That was the easy part. To be honest, my line manager was really inefficient, which I found very frustrating. I'd always thought that how well I did the job was simply up to me, but it was impossible in that situation. I considered applying for promotion, but I didn't really want to end up spending the rest of my working life there, so I decided to leave and go to university. Right. Do you think that you could have handled the situation better? Maybe, but I'm generally okay communicating with people, and I did try to get round the problem, but somehow I couldn't. So I just planned my work for myself and did the best I could. No, where I need to improve somehow is in coming to a decision. I'm far too likely to put it off because I keep thinking of yet another reason for one course of action or another. I'm hopeless when I need to think quickly. <laughs> I suspect that more people are like that than will admit it. So what do you want to get out of your work placement? We've been studying the sort of challenges that companies have to deal with, like the country's economic situation, competition from other businesses, and so on. So I'd like to find out how companies work out a long-term strategy in response to those difficulties. That rather than the day-to-day -day operations. Hmm. I'm not sure we've got any work placements available that will really help you with that. That's OK. Any sort of placement would be useful, I should think. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Right, well, here's a list of the work placements we've got on our files for this coming summer. Uh, let's have a quick look through them and decide which ones to look at in more detail. They're all in the retail sector. Is that OK? That's fine. Good. Well, this one's a chain of restaurants. I have to say its reputation for staff relations isn't very good, so you might not want to work there. Though, to be fair, I've used its website to book a table or order a takeaway a few times, and it's much more efficient than other restaurants' websites I've used. And my local restaurant always seems to be full of customers. OK, that's a possibility. Mm-hmm. Next, there's a cinema chain. Oh, they've got a cinema in my hometown. It's quite old and big, and they've got some offices that they no longer use, so they let local clubs meet there free of charge. Yes, it's company policy that all their cinemas should do something to help local organisations. I think that's great. Though I usually book my tickets online, and it's hard to navigate round the website. I've had that problem too. What do you think of this chain of bookstores? Isn't that the company that converts attractive old banks and things so their premises are really nice? Yes, that's the one. 
A lot of customers go in just to look around, and not all of them buy any books. The staff must like working in attractive surroundings too. <laughs> I'm sure you're right. Let's see. This next one is with a chain of coffee shops. I often go there for coffee, even though some other chains are cheaper. They're very popular, aren't they?、Mm, that's because they're very careful about the sources of their coffee, and treat the growers very well. That means they can be sure of getting high-quality coffee beans. Oh, I didn't know that. The last placement we've got at the moment is with a home furnishings chain. They're well known for their low staff turnover because the company provides relatively high wages and a generous holiday allowance. Right. Well, that sounds. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now look at section four. Section four. You will hear part of a lecture about the signals that animals use to communicate with each other. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. The study of animal communication has been growing rapidly in recent years, and in today's lecture, I'll be looking at the main ways in which animals communicate with others of their own or different species, which of course can include human beings. The definition of communication that I'll be using. Is the sending of information to another animal with the intention of affecting its behaviour in some way. The signals that animals use can be classified into four main groups, and I'll start by briefly outlining them. Pheromones are chemicals that an animal secretes. They're particularly common among social insects, such as ants and bees. A social meaning that they live in large groups and function as a society. For example, when ants find a source of food, they create a trail of scented pheromones leading to it, thus indicating to other ants where to go. If the source is plentiful, they add pheromones on both the outward and return trips. But as the food becomes scarce, they stop adding on their return. So the strength of the smell provides further information. Each species of ant has between about ten and twenty pheromone perfumes, and they're all used to communicate something different. This can be to summon anything from a few ants to thousands in order to attack their prey, defend the colony, or organize the relocation of the colony. One specific pheromone is used by squashed ants to warn others of danger. The response of the other ants may then be to swarm and sting the attacker. Dogs sniff each other to collect chemical information and also release chemicals in their urine. They use this to mark their territory so that other dogs know who is in control and that they should stay away. 
In this case, the communication takes place over time, unlike most communication which is immediate. That is, the receiver of the signal normally receives it as soon as it's sent. The next category of signals are the auditory cues. Birds are the main users of this method. The males of certain species sing to attract mates. They also make a different noise to give warnings or make threats. And they coordinate group behaviour using sound. Not all their sounds are made with their voices. Some species, like the ruffed grouse, beat the air with their wings to create a vacuum. Then the air rushes in, creating a booming noise. One species of monkey, vervet monkeys, live in closely knit social groups and have a highly developed system of calls. Whereas most animals have just one cry to warn of predators, vervets have a different alarm call to indicate each of their four main threats – leopards, eagles, pythons and baboons. Vervets hearing an alarm will look at the caller, look in the direction the threat is coming from, then race to an appropriate place of safety. For instance, in a bush to avoid attack by eagles, or on branches furthest from the trunk of a tree which can support their weight but not that of a leopard. One set of visual cues are called badges. These are the animal's colour and shape. In some species of monkey, females undergo a change of colour to indicate that they're at the stage in their reproductive cycle when they are fertile and so ready to mate. Colour can be used in a very different way too. Some animals, like the poison dart frog, are very brightly coloured. Yellow, gold, copper, red, green, blue or black and they have elaborate designs. The purpose of this coloration is to warn animals that might want to eat them that they are toxic and are best avoided. Certain related species of fish, including pufferfish and porcupine fish, have an unusual skill. They puff themselves up like a balloon with water or air to make themselves look much bigger than they really are. This is a defence mechanism that they employ when they're in danger of being eaten and is intended to scare off the fish attacking them. Interestingly, this is an example of animals telling lies. The other visual cues are displays, that is, behaviour. If you're a dog owner, you'll be familiar with dogs displaying their pleasure at seeing you by wagging their tails. Many animals send visual cues as threats. Dogs growl. Chimpanzees may raise their arms, slap the ground, or stare fixedly at the animal they're threatening. Another message is communicated by juvenile chimpanzees that come too close to an adult male. They grin to show submission to the dominance of the male. The fourth category of signals is tactile cues. And, of course, these are only possible if the animals concerned are in close enough proximity to touch each other. Many primates, such as chimpanzees and baboons, engage in social grooming, removing skin parasites from each other and cleaning wounds. This helps to reinforce cooperation within the social unit. And in some species, it's also a way of communicating a wish to resolve conflict. Grooming isn't limited to primates. It's carried out by some species of birds, bats, insects and other animals too. That is the end of section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test.